Hello, multivariable calculus students. This is Mr. Johnson, and this is section 9.5, which is on equations of lines and planes. And in this video, we're going to focus our attention on the development of a line in space and the different forms that we can write these lines in. As a quick review, if we think back to just an xy plane and all of the lines we've written in the past, all we really need is a single point on the line and a slope of the line. So if we were to have, for instance, uh, the point x1, y1 and the slope m, we could write the traditional point slope form which we've done in the past, and that is um, sufficient to write the equation of a line on a plane. In space, it's really very, very similar. So we have a point in space. Uh, we're going to call that point the initial point x sub 0, y sub 0, z sub 0. And we're going to give that the vector r sub naught. So in other words, what we have here is uh, this point on a particular line that we can identify, any point in the line. And we're going to get there by taking a vector from the origin to that point. So we're going to cause uh, a, a straight path from a position vector standpoint. So we have this, this vector from the origin that goes out to some random point on this particular line. Now, in order to get to another point along the line, um, let's just call that point generically x, y, z, we would travel along a vector a. So let's say that here is vector a, I'll put it in green. We have vector A, and it allows us to access another point on the line. Now, that particular vector that's formed is going to be labeled as R, so sort of a generic general vector, which is labeled as X, Y, and Z. Now, the vector A is only um, a certain length, and so what we have then is the vector R sub naught added to A giving us vector r. So in other words, we have this point on a line, x sub naught, y sub naught, z sub naught. We add the vector a. So we have our initial, add the vector a, and we get the resultant vector, which we call r, which is going to be x, y, and z, a, a, another point on the line. That's good for us if we wanted to go from one point to another point on the line. But if we're wanting to go to really any point in the line, we want to go to r sub naught, access the initial points x, y, and z, and then we want to be able to travel not just in one direction along the line, getting us a, a number of points, but in the other direction as well. And so what we're going to do is take a, which right now is a little bit generic, and we're going to make it a scalable vector. So we're going to, we're going to use t as sort of a standard scale, and we're going to have a vector v, which is considered parallel to the line. Now you see in the diagram that we have vector v listed. I'm going to draw that right here in blue. So here's vector v. Vector v is parallel to our line, and the generic components of, of v is a, b, and c. And those are just dummy variables. That's just standard in our textbook and in most textbooks. So we're going to let a equal this value t, the parameter t, which is going to scale the vector v. So if we look at the diagram over here on the right, let's say that t is equal to 0. So in other words, we have 0 times v, which means basically that we have the initial r sub naught vector. Let's say t is 1. Well, then maybe if we were to multiply v by 1, we would end up moving out r sub naught we would move in the direction of v um, with a scale of 1, and we would land here, let's say, and get a point on the line. So maybe, just hypothetically, this would be when t is equal to 1. Then if we were to do t is equal to 2, so we were going to scale the vector v to be 2, we would travel again along r sub naught. We would go twice as far along v, the, the uh, scale of v, and we would get t is 2. And we can do the same thing with t is 3, and t is 4, and t is 1.5, and t is 0.8, and so on and so forth. And what we start getting is all of these points. 
Well, we could also let t be negative, which means that we would be over here on this side of it. Maybe this is going to be t is negative 1 and t is negative 2 and so on. What we end up getting is a huge number of points that end up forming this line in space. So if we were to come up with both of these items that we have list all these little equations that we have listed for r and r sub naught and t and v and put it together we get what's called the vector equation of the line l and that equation is r equal to r sub naught plus t times the vector v and again this is really similar to the idea behind at the very beginning when we talked about a line on an xy plane what we have here is a point, the, the point specifically in this case is going to be x sub naught, y sub naught, and z sub naught. We're allowing the vector r sub naught to represent this point. So again, the vector is, a, is allowing us to access the point in space. And then we have a slope associated with that. And the, the slope is basically going to be our vector v, which is a, b, and c. And that slope, uh, which we called, you know, we call m generically in an, in a plane. That slope v, a, b, and c. That slope is going to allow us to then track points along the line and access any value that we want to. Now there are a bunch of different forms of lines, similar to when you think back to other classes, uh, algebra, algebra two, and then uh, single variable calculus. You have point slope form, you have slope intercept form. You have standard form, and those all represent a line, even though they look a little bit different. Well, here we have a, a small handful of equations that represent a line as well. So again, the first one is the vector equation of a line, which you need to know and memorize. Um, if we were to put this into component form, so the vector r is made up of x, y, and z based on our diagram above. And r sub naught is made up of x sub naught, y sub naught, and z sub naught. And t is our scale, and v is made up of a, b, and c. So we have the component forms of our vectors. Now on the next page, what I'm going to do is show you two other forms of a line based on what I've just written out, the component form of, the, of um, a line. Keep in mind that these two equations are really the same. One is in sort of the vector notation form, and the second one down here um, on the bottom that I'm putting in a box, that one's really in component form. But keep in mind that both of these are basically the same. They're the vector equation of a line. Okay, so what I'm going to do is pause and just write out the vector equation of a line again. Okay, so here is the component form of the vector equation of a line. And one of the second forms that we're going to study is the parametric equations um, of a line. There are going to be three of them. They're each associated with x and then y and then z. So if you were to take the component form that I've written here in black and you were to take x and solve for just the parts of x that you would have in the equation on the right, you would have x sub naught plus a times the parameter t. Then you would have y equal to y sub naught plus um, a, excuse me, b times the parameter t, and then z equal to z sub naught plus c times the parameter t. So in other words, again, you know, if you connect it to single variable calculus, we have parametric equations that allowed us to track the x component and the y component based on parameter t. Well, this is going to be the same thing because remember x sub naught, y sub naught, z sub naught, that's the initial point. So those are all numeric values. A, B, and C is the parallel vector. That's a numeric set of values. And so T is our variable here that, that changes. That's the parameter that is allowing us to access x and then access y and then access z. Um, so this gives us a line, gives us the same thing as the vector equation, but this is considered the parametric equations um, of a line. If we eliminate the parameter, now what I'm going to do is show you just the one for x, and then you, you basically perform the same mathematics for the other two. So if we were to balance this and um, subtract x sub naught, and then divide by a, we solve for t. 
Now we could do this for every single one of these equations. So we could do this for y and z. If you do that, we get what's called the symmetric equations for a line. It looks like this. We have x minus x sub naught divided by a equal to y minus y sub naught divided by b equal to z minus z sub naught divided by c. And all of this is equal to t, the parameter. So the symmetric equations actually eliminate the parameter and you get these three separate sets that are all equal to each other. And again, this is just a third equation of a line. So similar to single variable calculus where you have your point slope, slope intercept, and standard forms, those three equations are helpful for different reasons. So in some contexts you want one, in other contexts you want a different one. Same thing here. We have our vector equation um, of a line which is going to be in black up here that I'm putting a box around. We have our parametric equations in red that I'm putting a box around and then now we have the green equations. These three equations you must know and be able to not only fill out given um, the situation but also analyze and pull out the important information from these equations. And there's a note here about the vector v. So the vector v is made up of a, b, and c, and it's, again, describing the direction of the line, so it's parallel to the line. The numbers a, b, and c that make up that vector are called directional numbers because, again, we're thinking of that as the slope of the line that's directing us to where we need to go along the line to access additional points. Okay, let's try our first example. So we're going to find the vector equation and the parametric equations for the line that passes through the point and is parallel to the vector given. Now remember, the point that we're given here, we're going to create a vector for that point. So we're going to call our initial vector 5, 1, and 3. And the, the difference here is that this, this uh, point, in parentheses, is in space. We want to go from the origin to that point. So think of it as... Um, and I know this might be really simple, but it's going to possibly get more complex here in a minute. So if we're going from the origin to this point and we're creating a vector between those, that's what r sub naught is. So all we're doing is going from the origin to that particular point as our initial vector. Then we are given vector v in the problem, which is going to be 1, 4, and negative 2. Okay, so we're going to come up with a vector equation first. Okay, the vector equation is r equal to r sub naught, which is 5, 1, 3, plus t, the variable that we're scaling everything by, um, times the vector 1, 4, and negative 2. And then again, if we're going to uh, come up with the other set, which is the parametric equations, We're just going to take that vector equation and basically solve for the components. So we have x equal to the x value, which is 5, plus 1 times t, and y equal to 1, plus 4 times t, and z equal to 3, minus 2 times t. So again, both of these equations give the equation for the line. They're just in different forms. Second part of this problem is asking us for two other points on the line. Now remember, the parameter t is allowing us to access as many points as we want along the line. So for example, let's say that t will let uh, t equal 0. If we look at the parametric equations, and we plug in 0, 0, and 0, we end up getting 5, 1, and 3, which is exactly our initial point. That's the whole kind of purpose behind how we set up our equations is that that initial point should be the initial point when t is 0. Okay, so that doesn't really help us. We want two different points, so let's let t equal 1. Well, again, if we go to our parametric equations, we plug in 1 for t, 1 for t, 1 for t. We end up getting, uh, let's see, 6 for x and 5 for y and 1 for z. So that's a different point that's on the line. We could let um, t equal 1, negative 1 if we wanted to. So if that's the case, we have x is equal to 4, 
and x is, and uh, excuse me, y is equal to negative three, and then z is equal to positive five. And again, you could let t be anything, a whole number, a negative number, a decimal, it doesn't matter. You'll get additional points along this particular line. You could use the parametric equations in green. You could use the uh, vector equation in blue, either way. All right, let's move on to the next page. Okay, on the next page here, we're going to do a couple more examples and then talk about, believe it or not, an additional um, form of a line. This is a line segment, but let's do example two first. So we have parametric equations and symmetric equations of a line that passes through the two points A and B. You can see a little picture of it. Um, not that that will necessarily help a whole lot visually, but at least you get an idea of what's going on. So we're not given um, an initial point. So let's go ahead and pick either A or B. I'm just gonna pick A. So my initial vector is going to be two, four, and negative three. Could you have picked B? Of course, you could pick any point on the line is totally fine, just like in single variable calculus, right in the equation of a line, if you need a point, you can pick any point on the line. Okay, for, for the vector V, remember that vector V, it needs to be um, the directional vector for the line. And remember, there's a ton of different options. You can have it all sorts of different sizes as long as it's the right direction. I'm going to make it easy, and I'm going to make it just the vector AB because that's what I'm given. So the vector V, the directional vector, is going to be 1. And, and again, remember, you're taking the component of B and subtracting A. Component of B, subtracting A. So we have negative 5, and then we have positive 4. <clears throat> okay, I think we have everything we need. Let's first start with the parametric equations. So we have x equal to 2 plus 1 times t, y equal to 4 minus 5 times t, z equal to negative 3 plus 4 times t. And then the symmetric equations, um, let's see, these are a little bit new because we haven't done one of those yet. So remember what we're doing is in each of the red equations that we had, we're solving for t. So the first one is x minus 2 divided by 1. Uh, the next one would be y minus 4 divided by negative 5. <clears throat> and then it would be z plus 3 divided by 4. And remember, the whole thing is equal to t. So those are the symmetric equations uh, for that line. Okay, so for this one, we're looking at, in part B, at what point does the line intersect the xy plane? Now, in the picture, this P, this point P, is really at least attempting to notate um, where this line crosses the xy plane. All we got to think about logically is what z is. So on the xy plane, z is equal to zero. Now we could use the parametric equations or the symmetric equations. I'm gonna actually show you how to use the symmetric equations. So remember you have three different sets here, they're all equal. You can pull out any two of these and set them equal. So for instance, let's say I wanted to look at just this set of two. Well, if z is zero, that means that x minus two is equal to three fourths, which means that if we add um, two to that, then x would equal 11 fourths. Then I could uh, take y minus 4 divided by negative 5 and set it equal to z plus 3 over 4. And again, if z is 0, we have y minus 4 um, is equal to, let's see, 3 fourths times negative 5, so negative 15 fourths. And if we were to add 4, we would get y um, is equal to <coughs> Let's see, that's going to be 16, so uh, one fourth, positive one fourth. So what we have for this uh, particular part, which point it's going to be when x is 11 fourths, y is one fourth, and z is going to be zero. That's going to be when that point occurs. So again, we can we can start to open the door to um, a lot more in space than we obviously could do on a plane. But remember the 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 main thread of uh, in this case, analyzing a line, really that main that main thread of what we're talking about is the same in single variable calculus that it was in, or there it is in multivariable calculus. You need a point, you need a slope, and then you can come up with a line. 
All right, let's discuss a line segment. So here's a, you know, just a quick review. There's the vector equation of a line and now a line segment. Now you're going to see some equations for a line segment. Um, and I want you to be aware of that. However, it's important to understand that a line segment is identical to the equation of a line with a restriction. That's all it is. Okay. So if I'm, if I'm asked, you know, come up with an equation for a line segment, I actually will not use this formula during, you know, any, any kind of instruction to all of you. I will simply use the vector equation of a line and I will just simply dictate what the uh, domain is in order to restrict it to a segment versus an entire line. So let me show you what I mean by that. Let me see if I can convince you of what's going on here. So what we have is um, we have the, the equation R equal to one minus T times R sub naught plus T times R sub one. Okay. Now <clears throat> I'm going to draw this really quickly. This is what this is where they're trying to like, pull this information from. So let's say that we have x, y, and z, and let's say that you have this line in space, okay? And this would be representative of r sub naught, and this would be representative of let's say r sub one. OK, and and so what we're analyzing here in yellow is this segment. That's that's the goal of what we're trying to figure out. Now, they, you know, Stuart comes up with this formula for it. And it seems like, OK, all right, this is now a fourth formula that I have to memorize for the line or a line segment. And yeah, you could, but I'm, I'm going to try to keep it to three. OK, so really, I want you to know the vector equation of a line, parametric equations of a line, symmetric equations of a line. I don't need you to know this one, and here's why. If you distribute the r sub naught, you get r sub naught minus t times r sub naught plus t times r sub 1. I'm going to rearrange this just slightly, okay? So we have, um, I'm going to put r sub 1 first. So we have this little set here. Now I'm going to factor out a t. So we have r sub 1 minus r sub naught. Now, <clears throat> what do you think that r sub 1 minus r sub naught sort of looks like? What, you know, what could we maybe classify this yellow vector, basically? We're taking r sub 1 minus r sub naught. Why don't we just go ahead and call that vector v? Well, if so, this might look a little bit familiar. This is just the vector equation of a line. That's why I use the vector equation of a line. Now, why does Stuart do, um, do this in his textbook? Well, the reason he does that is because then the parameter for t is 0 to 1. The parameter for t could change depending on how you develop the equation. So this, you know, the vector equation right here, depending on what you use for v, means that t would change. I'm going to try to... Um, give you an example of what I'm talking about here in the next problem. But just, just know that you don't need to memorize the equation in the box that I just gave. You could take the vector equation and just change your parameter so that it's a segment versus a line. Okay, so in, in example three, we have a vector equation of a line that passes through these two points. So again, this is, um, by the way, if you want to just pause and try this, Part A is review of the first two examples, okay? So part A is not new. So if you want to pause and give it a shot, you certainly can. <clears throat> All right, so R sub naught is going to be, I'm just going to make it the first point. And then V is going to be the vector between the two points, which is 2, um, 7, and uh, negative 3, okay? So the vector equation is r equal to 2 times negative, or I'm sorry, 2, negative 1, and 4, plus t, and then 2, 7, and negative 3. Okay, so that, again, that's a line in space not new to this example. That's based on the last two examples. Okay, now we want the line segment. And um, in this equation that we have, I'm going to go ahead and say that 
this equation is the segment from these two points if, so I'm going to let this t value go from 0 to 1. Now, why would we choose that? Well, let's let uh, t equal 0. What point do we get? Well, if t is 0, we simply get 2, negative 1, and 4 because it would be 0 times that second vector. Let's let t equal 1. Well, if t equals 1, then we have our first vector plus our second vector, which gives us, magically, the point 4, 6, and 1. Well, there you go. So if we're focused on these two points, we just accomplished that by letting t be from 0 to 1. Okay, what if, just hypothetically, um, what if we had the vector equation 2, negative 1, and 4 plus t, and then we'll do, let's see, 4 and 14 and negative 6. <clears throat> All right, so the first question is, are these two vectors that I just wrote, do they represent the same line? And the answer is they do because the initial point is the same. The vector v, 2, 7, negative 3, is simply just scaled by a factor of 2 to get 4, 14, and negative 6, which means that v is still um, pointed in the same direction. It's just a slightly different size, but that's okay because v is just simply the direction of the line. It, the size of it doesn't really matter. Okay, so then the question is, how do I restrict my t values in order to get the line segment from um, these two, you know, let's just call this point A, this first one, and call this point B, all right? Well, I start with zero, and the reason that we start with zero is because if if t is zero, we still get that initial point, so, that, so we're still happy with that, okay? <clears throat> Where do I end it? Well, I'm going to end it at one half, and the reason I end it at one half is because if I let t equal one half, then, and I plug it into my equation, I get the point 4, 6, 1, and that's it. That's where I want the line segment to stop. If we were to let t be equal to 1, well, then what I'm going to get for a point, if I was to, again, plug in 1 right here for t, I would get, let's see, that's going to be 6 and 13, and it looks like negative 2. Well, that point doesn't work. That point is beyond the line segment. And so I do not want to include um, anything beyond 0 to 1 half for t, okay? Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to continue giving you all these random examples, but if v is different, okay, then t might be different if you're trying to base it on a line segment. So here's my advice. If you let v, the vector v, be from the first point to the second point and, and you don't change it otherwise, your, your domain for the line segment is always zero to one because V starts at the beginning of the line segment and ends at the end of the line segment. V does not go beyond that or point in the opposite direction. And therefore T will be from zero to one. I hope that makes sense. I know it's a little bit strange, but we can do some more of those together. Okay, let's move on to the last page. All right, here we have two uh, last examples. Example four is not a new example, and so um, if you want to pause and try this one just to see, you know, kind of at what, at what point you're understanding the material, go ahead and do so. All right, I'm going to let r sub naught be the first point, and I'm going to let v be the vector between the points. Okay, so it's going to be negative five and three and negative four. And again, it's a line segment, therefore I'm going to let V start at the beginning and end at the end. And then T is 0 to 1. So your vector equation uh, is, and I'm going to do that first. So the vector equation is R equal to 10, whoops, 10, 3, and 1, plus T times negative 5, 3, and negative 4. And, uh, and then based on the vector equation, we'll come up with our answer here, which is going to be the parametric equations. 
So we get x equal to 10 minus 5t and y equal to 3 plus 3t and z equal to 1 minus 4t. And then again, we need to restrict our t values because it's a line segment and we set it up in sort of a smart way. <clears throat> so we have the t values from 0 to 1. Okay, I hope that helps. I hope you got that one if you tried it on your own. All right, last little bit about lines right now, at least, before we move on to planes. We're talking about skew lines, and skew lines do not intersect, and they are not parallel. So skew lines are, they, they lie in different planes. And so what we're going to do is prove that these two lines are skew lines. So the first thing we're going to do is analyze whether or not they're parallel. Easiest way to do this is to take a look at their directional vectors. So the directional vector for the first line, remember that's the value associated with the parameter t. Okay, So we have the directional vector 1, 3, and negative 1. And again, it's just the coefficient associated with t. Now line 2 has a different parameter. It has the parameter s. Now remember, you can have a different parameter depending on any kind of line you want, that's not a big deal. So in this case, they're just using T and S to notate that the two lines are, are different. If they both use the parameter T, just keep in mind that does not mean that they're the same T's. Okay, so just <clears throat> like if you had two different lines on a plane, if you're, you know, plugging in one for X on the one line, that doesn't mean you have to plug in one for X on the other line, you could plug in something different. All right, so the directional vector for the second line is going to be, again, the coefficients of s. So we have 2, 1, and 4. Okay, if we're analyzing whether or not these are parallel, if these two vectors could be multiplied by something and they are equal then, so in other words, they're scalars of each other, then these two lines could be parallel. Mathematically, what I'm talking about is that you could take the first vector 1, and it would be equal to the second vector's component times, let's say, a uh, number a. And the, the second component of the first vector would equal the second vector's middle component 1 times a. And the third component of the first one would be equal to the third component times a. So if there was a value a, that would make these three things true, then these two lines would be parallel. Now we can see that if a is three, and you know we, we plug it in here, we certainly do not get negative one when we take three times four. So if we're analyzing that they're parallel, in this kind of case, based on the evidence we've seen, they're absolutely not parallel. So then the next step is that what we have to do is analyze um, whether or not they intersect. Okay, so this one's a little more extensive. Um, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the easiest ways to do this is to say that the, the x value of the first line must equal the x value of the second line, and the y value of the first must equal the y value of the second, and the z value of the first must equal the z value of the second, if in fact they do intersect, okay? So essentially what we set up is a large system of equations. Let's solve for t in the first one. And then what we'll do is we'll just substitute that in for the second one and see if we can solve for <clears throat> an s value and, and, uh, and then kind of go from there. So we have 3 times this quantity um, equal to 3 plus s. So let's see, we get negative 2 plus 6s minus 3 equal to 3 plus s. Okay, so we have 5s uh, equal to 8. So s is equal to 8 fifths. All right, let's go ahead and go back for a minute here. And we get t equal to 2 times 8 fifths minus 1. So that will be 16 fifths minus 1, which is going to be 11 fifths. 
All right, what we have is a possible set of T and S values that could prove that they intersect, or in this case, prove that they don't intersect. Let's try them in the third equation. So we have four minus T, which is 11 fifths, and we're gonna see if it's equal to negative three plus four times eight fifths. That's what we're testing, okay? So with the first two equations, we got something that would work uh, based on them. We're just seeing if it works in the third one. So on the left side, what we get is 9 fifths. And on the right side, we get 32 fifths. And then we're, we're adding that negative 3. So we end up getting 17 fifths. And of course, those are not equal at all. Um, so our conclusion here uh, can certainly be that um, there is not a S or T value that satisfies the three equations. Okay, and again, this just shows that they are not skew lines because they do not intersect and they are not parallel. Okay, the next videos 495 will focus around planes and then um, the interaction between planes and space and lines and points and so on. Thank you.